Okay. So I've got a little uh, slideshow for you guys to follow along. This is going to be sort of the, the key topics from unit number one and unit number two. Uh, obviously, these are the things that we really want to make sure that we have an understanding of. And as we've been looking through some of the key concepts in the practice tests, it looks like these are the ones where we need to really improve. So the older stuff back to chapter 12, chapter 13, chapters you know 15 and 16, all the way to 18 and 19, some of those chapters where we want to go back to and start reviewing. So in, in a basic sense, one of the things that I really want you guys to understand is that the time span for both units one and two is 1200 to 1450. So it's kind of a weird place to start for the AP board because it kind of drops you right in the middle of the Middle Ages, uh, no pun intended there. But 1200 is kind of in between the 500 to 1500 of the Middle Ages. So it doesn't really follow a true chronology or a narrative in these units, uh, but there's a lot of hopping around. So therefore, what you really need to understand is that an important skill set for units one and two is comparison. And what you want to really want to do is you want to compare civilizations, like the formations of states, governments, what we might think of as countries today, and how do they gain, and then how do they maintain their power? That's really, I think, if I were to tell you one of the big picture things to know about this time span is, okay, you've got these old school land-based civilizations, and you want to make sure that you understand how they gain power, how they control the people, but then also how they maintain that power. And a lot of the maintenance of power can be economics, can be taxation, uh, can be military. Uh, so those are some of the things and examples that you're gonna wanna have at, at hand. Okay, looks like all fifth hour guys. I hope that that link is working for other, other classes. That's gonna really bother me. Um, has anybody heard from anybody that the link's not working for them? I don't know. Okay. Here's some places that you're going to really need to know. Okay. Some places that you're going to really need to know. One of the things about unit number one and two is you need to know enough so that you can answer multiple choice and SAQ questions. We know the AP College Board has told us that the DBQ will most likely not be coming from these units. Okay. The LEQ though, where you have three choices, could have one of the options coming from this time span. Within that criteria, there are two types of states that you might want to have an understanding of. Aiden, go ahead, bud. Um, this, uh, this PowerPoint that you have, is it available to us or is it just something that you have? Um, I can make it available. I can, um, I can share it with you at the end in the chat and you can grab it there or I can post it on the bulletin board, whatever is easiest for you guys. I can do both. Yeah, at the end, I can just uh, I can just do that, Aiden. Is that fine? All right. Yeah, cool. Thank you. OK, no problem. So, right. Lango, we have to go, but thank you for doing the thing. Yeah, I'm going to have a recording of it. I'm recording it on Loom, so I'll post it to my uh, YouTube channel tonight. All right. Thank you. All right. OK, now here are some key uh, places that you're going to want to know. There's two real types of states or countries, empires that you're going to want to be able to decipher. There's the large land-based empires. What I mean by this are these are those old school empires, statehoods, classic. And then there's the smaller states or city states that serve as inter intermediaries uh, between the larger states. So here's a list that I've created of the large land-based groups from units one and two. You've got the Song Dynasty, you have the Mongols, you have the Delhi Sultanate. Anytime you see the word Sultanate, that's going to be an Islamic controlled region. Okay. Uh, so when you see Sultan or Sultanate, uh, like Delhi, that is going to be referring to an Islamic area of control. Uh, the Khmer is another empire. The Abbasid Caliphate is one that you're going to have to know. The Abbasid Caliphate is one of the first groups that we actually looked at in chapter 12 when we learned about Islam back, I'm sorry, back in chapter 10. Uh, you have the Mamluks, which were pretty much military slaves that were eventually taking over Egypt. You have Mali, which is where Mansa Musa was from. The Byzantine Empire, which had the capital city of Constantinople. We learned about them in chapter 11. England, we learned a lot about. The Aztec and the Inca, we also focused on 
uh, those civilizations and empires as well. So those are your large land-based empires. Um, give me one second. Here is a map of all of these big places that I'm talking about. The bold ones, those are kind of your large land-based empires and, and land-based states. So Mongols up here in northern China, Song Dynasty, Delhi, Sultanate right here in northern India. You've got the Khmer, okay? You've got the Mamluks, like I said, from Egypt. Great Zimbabwe that we learned about down here. Mali, Western Africa. You've got the Swahili coast right here's the Swahili coast. This is, of course, along the eastern coast of Africa. You've got the Inca. You've got the Aztec of central Mexico. The Mississippian tribes and cultures are also located right along that Mississippi River Valley. Al-Andalus is a Muslim-controlled region of southern Spain. Um, and then you have also England, um, the Byzantine Empire, and of course, the Abbasid Caliphate. If I were to give you some advice, let's say you had None of you should be in this predicament, by the way, but let's just say you slacked off and you only studied two big things from units one and two. I would suggest the Song Dynasty of China and the Abbasid Caliphate of the Middle East. Those would be the two things that I would do my research on. And I would say that there's, in my experience teaching this class, there's a vast majority of questions on the MCQs that come from those two regions. And I think that you guys saw that there were a lot of questions about the Song in the practice exam that we did last week. So that would be one of my big points of advice uh, to take forward. Okay, here, now we're going to the smaller states. Okay, some of these smaller states, city states that were island and, and maritime states like the Majapahit, the Srivijaya, Malacca, the Swahili coast, Great Zimbabwe, the Mississippian tribes, which I also said could be considered a large one, and then Al-Andalus, which it's a land-based empire, uh, but it's a little bit smaller. The big thing about all of these, they are also on this map. I'll show you. So down here is Srivijaya, Majapahit, the Strait of Malacca. These groups down here, their big goal was actually to serve as intermediaries. They were like, they formed tributary regions and they collected tribute for ships to pass through these regions. They would have like pirates, but were almost like a navy that would funnel ships that were coming to China to try and gain access to goods. It would funnel them through the Strait of Malacca and then they would charge them like a tax to, to go through. And that's how they got fairly wealthy and actually became fairly significant. So those are some of the things that you're gonna wanna know. Obviously we learned about the Swahili coast when we learned about East Coast of Africa. And we talked about how they traded with people from the port of Calicut here in India and also the Arabic traders from the Middle East. Actually, Swahili is a mixture of African languages known as Bantu and Arabic. That's where the word actually comes from. Okay, let's talk a little bit more about some of those groups. What I wanna say, everybody in the world at this time that has ships or can travel by land, they're trying to get to Asia and they're trying to get to Asia for trade and economic purposes. During this time, Asia, the Middle East, were running the world. Europe was far behind at this time in comparison to China and um, the opposite caliphate. Okay, now some detail about each of these regions. Let's start with Southeast Asia. This is one I think that you guys have a little weak point on. So to be honest with you, many of us have probably never heard of these places and regions before taking this class. To be honest with you, before I started teaching AP, I had not heard of Majapahit or Srivijaya or Malacca. I mean, I know there's a straight Malacca, but I didn't know there was a civilization. So I'm imagining that a lot of this is new for many of you as well. I want to talk about one of the areas that's still considered Southeast Asia. That's the Delhi Sultanate of India. This was the first Islamic empire in India, is made up of Afghan Afghani or Muslims that are now from Afghanistan, they invaded Northern India. One of the things you have to understand is that it's almost impossible to rule all of India because of its vast diversity. What I mean by vast diversity, I'm talking about culturally, religiously, because there are Hindus, but then there are Buddhists, and then now there are Muslims being introduced. Um, and then uh, one of the things you have to understand is that it's geographically diverse, mountains, deserts, ocean land, you know, there's, there's rivers, uh, so there's great diversity in India, making it really difficult for any type of entity to rule the entire thing. It really, 
it really wasn't ruled by any single entity at this time. I mean, when you think about the Delhi Sultanate, they controlled the north, but down in the bottom, there was a Hindu majority that did not want to be controlled by the Delhi Sultanate. So this group was its first, though, Islamic government system to rule over the Hindus in the north. And what they did is they put themselves on top of what the Indians called the caste system. The caste system was this rigid social hierarchy uh, where you, you didn't have much social mobility up or down. You're stuck in whatever caste you're born into. Now, the vast majority of India, I would say, still remained Hindu. As Muslims started to migrate into India, though, from the Abbasid Caliphate, what their goal was was to try and convert people and also expand trade. Um, they did have to conquer because India already controlled trade routes and they did not want to give them up and they did not need Muslim support. They were not looking to the Muslims for any help. Um, they can eventually the Muslims took control, but they only controlled the north. Like I said, the southern half of India was still Hindu and they were going to try to take back the land in the north. They do not want the Muslims taking over. So that's one of the key ideas to understand about the Delhi Sultanate. Next, I think another big issue or a big thing uh, is Dar al-Islam. Dar al-Islam, don't be confused by the word. It just means the Islamic state of control. It's just the area that Islam was kind of controlling during this time span. This was um, actually a large area of control. And the key thing about it is you have Sharia law and other rules and regulations that the people living within it have to follow. One of the necessary gains of this, though, is that if you're part of this group that you're following uh, the regulations and rules and laws, it's going to give you economic connections. Um, this is going to lead us into the Islamic golden age. Um, and one of the things that you want to understand is that these merchants and the medicine and the mathematics, like algebra, developing algebra, for example, all of these things come out of the Abbasid Caliphate. And there's massive promotion of trade by the Arabic merchants. I would say, like I said earlier, the Abbasids and the Song are really the most important groups uh, from this time period. Okay, Wyatt wants to be invited. Uh, okay, all right, I did that. Okay, moving forward, we're going to talk about some of those groups, like I said, you probably have never heard of before this class. Srivijaya, Majapahit, and Malacca, which was a sultanate also, by the way, that means under the form of Islamic control. Um, one of the groups is Khmer, Khmer Pass also. Go ahead, sir, if you have a question. Guys, feel free to interrupt me at any time. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to try and help you. Um, examples here include culture diffusion of religion. Um, this region was first Hindu, then a lot of it became Buddhist, and then eventually a lot of it became Muslim, like for example, Malacca. The spread of religion is something that you can see along trade routes here. Uh, they use sea-based trading. There are a lot of islands, many small states. For example, the Majapahit uh, develop a tributary system. There were nomadic sea peoples like sea nomads that came through this region and the Khmer land um, group was based in, on agriculture, and they were known as the breadbasket of Southeast Asia. Most of the agricultural goods came from the Khmer Empire. One of the key things that the AP College Board submits as an illustrative example is champa rice. Champa rice is a fast growing or faster growing strain of rice um, that basically was developed along uh, with Vietnam, and it really led to population increases in both Southeast Asia, but then also in China. There's a famous city in the Khmer uh, region called Angkor. And then there was a very famous temple called Angkor Wat. And these are good examples of how culturally mixed states can benefit from trade, mutually benefit from trade. So one of the things I would take from Srivijaya, Majapahit and Malacca, and then also Khmer, um, trade, cultural diffusion, uh, sea travel. Those are some of the key ideologies there. Okay, I've been talking about Song Dynasty and the Abbasid Caliphate. I think Dar al-Islam stands in place of the Abbasid Caliphate, but I want to talk about those two a little bit more. Both of these groups promoted trade and, of course, innovation. Um, Confucianism was a big part of the Song Dynasty. It created a social hierarchy, and it also created the civil service exam that we're going to talk about here in a second, and it also led into filial piety. Confucianism, though, is not necessarily 
easy to explain. It's kind of like half a religion and half a um, philosophy, really. It's not, it's not like the type of religions that we're used to learning about. The song, as I said, under the Confucius, uh, ideas of Confucius, they have a civil service test. And that system is where any male in China can take the civil service exam back then. The only way that you could get a job in government was if you passed that civil service exam. So education and, um, and intellectual ability was something that was a prized possession. Um, the opposites, first of all, they believe that Islam can be universal. They believe that Islam is something that can be spread universally. So their goal was to actually go out and gain converts. One of the things about Islam though, is that it states in the Quran that you cannot force, force someone to convert. That's one of the key ideas that they had to avoid. So a lot of their conversion was through trade. And like I said earlier, those economic opportunities that could come out of that. Uh, but the opposites also had the house of wisdom, which if you remember us learning about that, the house of wisdom was a center in Baghdad that was kind of like one of the world's first universities. It was a center of learning where artists, philosophers, mathematicians, astronomers would come and they would debate and discuss. They would study the ancient texts. They would translate some of the ancient texts into more um, modern versions where then Europeans eventually studied those. Without the House of Wisdom and other translation centers, a lot of those ancient Greek and Roman texts would have been lost forever. Uh, Baghdad. I want to talk about Baghdad. Like I said, the House of Wisdom was in Baghdad. Baghdad was like the New York City of the world at this time. Constantinople was another example of a city that was really popular, really a hopping area. Many people coming in and out for trade, um, things of that nature were going on in those regions. Al-Andalus was the southern Spanish wing of Dar al-Islam. Many people know the people from Al-Andalus as the Moors. Uh, some cities like Cordoba, Toledo are examples that had universities. Uh, Jewish people were brought into Al-Andalus, and um, this is when they were exiled from Christian states. They have large libraries in these places and translation centers. These are some of the other places that were translating many of the ancient texts that were being converted into Arabic and then later converted into languages of the common vernacular like French, uh, Latin, of course, um, I'm sorry, probably not Latin, uh, but French and Italian and also English, I should have said. That's my fault. Uh, these studies allowed for, like I said earlier, the Renaissance movement to occur in Europe. Okay, some big ideas here. Let's move into some big picture ideas, move out of the small details. Uh, one big picture idea that I want you guys to understand is legitimacy. Legitimacy is basically how states and leaders would use belief systems to assert their dominance um, or as a political tool to control people. One big example of this is the Aztecs using human sacrifice. If you remember when we learned about this, we talked about how they probably didn't believe that the gods were actually taking human blood. Some people might have, but really what they were doing this for is to try and keep a, a maintenance of control over the people. Religion, here's another big picture topic. Religion was used to create unity. Confucianism, for example, um, talked about some of the values like the mandate of heaven, where the ruler gets this position of emperor from God and they need to do good things to hold on to it. If things that start happening that are bad, then they can be replaced in what's called the dynastic cycle. So we learned about that way back in chapter 12 and actually in chapter four, early on in the year, when I was covering some of just the basic ideologies. I already talked to you about that civil service exam. Uh, that was really important. One thing about it is it was open to all males from throughout China. Uh, but unfortunately, you kind of you kind of had to be really wealthy to be able to pass that exam because you needed to get a tutor, somebody who could teach you the ins and outs of the exam or at least teach you the basics of. How do I say it? Uh, what are going to be on the test, kind of like what we're talking about in the last few weeks in the class. Okay, syncretism is another big picture ideology. Syncretism is something that's like um, cultural diffusion, where you take many different cultures and you blend them together to form something new. Like here's an example, like mosques in Africa, they're Islamic, uh, but obviously Islam comes from the Middle East. So what happens is 
you take a mosque, but you build it with local style architecture. And that's an example of syncretism. So you might have a mosque, which most of them in the Middle East have like really round ball like structures and minarets, but they might not look like that at all in Africa. And that's just an example of blending cultures to form something new. And that's an example of syncretism. I want to make sure that you guys understand medieval Europe was not unified at this time. Remember, we learned about feudalism where you have many of these different lords and they all kind of control their own little lands. Uh, they were not unified at all. The Byzantines um, were, were one of the only groups that were kind of unified in Europe. Most of them were decentralized. I would say though, Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is really the only source of Europe, European unity and stability. And we learned about how powerful the Catholic Church was uh, throughout our class. I want to make a, a mention about dates. Um, as I taught you all year, I don't do any specific quizzing on dates uh, because I, they're not that important on this test. You might want to know like time spans, like you should know that units one and two are from 1200 to 1450, but you don't need to go memorizing like key dates. Um, what I've said all year though, is you do want to get chronology, right? You, you want to be able to know, okay, this happened before this and after that. Uh, so that's something important, but it's more big picture than like very specific dates. You won't be, you won't be asked to list um, very specific dates on this exam. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. You might have to talk about time spans and uh, time periods. Um, you might uh, be, be given a date and then be able to say, okay, well, this was written in 1250. So that had to fall in unit one, which is when this, these type of groups were around. Uh, so those type of things might help you, but specific dates, I, I wouldn't get bogged down with studying that. One thing I would study though is innovation and exchange. Um, innovation is like advanced technology, exchange is trade. Um, the song and the opposite, like I've been saying all day today, those are two great examples of this. The song were really big promoters of innovation and change. Uh, there was this guy named Su Song. He's like China's Da Vinci, even though he came before Leonardo Da Vinci, but he was kind of like a very big inventor, a scientist, somebody who was propagating you know, intellectual thought. But the song developed the world's first paper, the first woodblock printing, they developed gunpowder, they create the compass, paper money. Uh, these inventions, these innovations were there to help make trade better and more efficient. Um, and the wealth that came in from all of these things created the ability to create even greater innovation. The Abbasids, on the other hand, the House of Wisdom, the translation centers, their ability to create math and geometry and algebra, that kind of set them apart from some of the other groups. In the Americas, you want to talk about the Inca. I mean, the Inca were most well known for their stoneworking. And you got to understand that they built their cities way up in the mountains. They did not have domesticated animals like llamas. They can't really carry more than like 20 or 30 pounds. So they're, they're pretty much they're pretty much useless when you talk about like being able to help you build anything. So they had to re rely on human manual labor. They built bridges, they built a road system. In fact, their roads were so specially designed that an Incan runner back then could travel along the roads faster than a bus can today in that same area because of the routes that they took. Terrace farming, where you built where you build ledges into the side of a hill or a mountain. And then when it rains, the water runs down the side. Those were very, very special creations of the Inca. Now, other groups have had them as well, like China had them, the Sumerians had them, the Mayans had them, but the Inca did it really well. And they grew uh, potatoes. They grew potatoes and other crops at a very high altitude, which is not easy. I read an article about the Incan potato growth, and they were able to harvest over 4,200 different types of potatoes, for example. So their agriculture was very stratified and they knew exactly what they were doing. The Aztec, on the other hand, you wanna remember that they developed that tribute system where they made their tributary states pay them, pay them money, gold, human lives, right? And they said, if you don't pay us this, then we're gonna come in and kill you all or we're gonna take you and perform human sacrifice. Okay, let's go to the Mongols. I mean, we talked, we learned a lot about the Mongols this year. 
But some of the stuff that we learned about that you guys really like, really were drawn to, probably won't be on the exam. Like, you're you're probably not going to have questions about Mongol violence, uh, but rather like what's known as the Pax Mongolica. The Pax Mongolica was basically a time period of Mongol peace. It's after the conquest time. Uh, they created stability and they created law and order. Mongol brutality made things very safe because people did not want to mess with the Mongols. Like if you lived within the Mongol empire, you didn't want to break the law because you knew what's about to happen. I mean, you're going to get killed. So that I guess you could relate the violence into like law and order. Um, but they took control of trade routes. They took control of the Silk Roads. It was pretty stable under their control, actually. I mean, they committed a lot of atrocities, too. Let's not forget that. But the Mongols really kind of thrive in the mid-1200s to mid-1300s, which would be like 1250 to 1350. Um, I want you to know that there's pre-Mongol and there's post-Mongol. Post, post time period is Mongol Empire and then their breakdown, which is known as the Yuan Dynasty of China. That's the name of the Mongol dynasty that ruled China. So don't get confused. Like if you see the Yuan, that's just the Mongols. That's the Mongols in which time period that they ruled China after the Song. Okay. Uh, I'm going to pause here for station identification. Does anybody have um, a, kick, a quick question? Does anybody have a question at this time that they would like to ask? Okay, I am going to post... Um, this we're going to be done here in just a few minutes i told you guys like 30 to 45 minutes so we're going to move ahead a little bit but uh we'll talk a little bit about this more uh, tomorrow um and then we kind of go from there but i'm uh, just trying to get some information there out to you guys and i will also rec i've recorded this and i'm going to post it on my youtube channel um, and i'll put a link to that on the bulletin board as well okay i want to talk about the benefits of trade because units one and two there's a lot of trade going on Here's the thing. If back then you controlled trade routes, you have a lot of power and you can get really wealthy from this. For example, like I mentioned earlier, the Southeast Asian states and then also Mansa Musa was a great example for Amali um, because the empire, his empire dominated the gold salt trade from the city of Timbuktu. Obviously, the Aztec tributary system is an example of um, benefit of trade. I mean, it's really fear for for goods, but that's what you're kind of trading your life for goods. Um, but nonetheless, it's still an example of this category. Medieval Europe, though, was not really a part of this trade. Um, they could have been, except for you had the manor system where, like, under feudalism, people never really left the manor their whole lives. They never really set foot more than, like, 30 miles off the manor for their entire lives. They had very simple lives. Um, so they really weren't a big part of this trade yet. They will be become part of this trade in the late 1400s. But at this time, they're not really a, a big major part of that. Some of the trading cities from 1200 to 1400 that I would mention, though, would be Hangzhou, China, Malacca, which we learned about already, Calicut, which is on the western port side of India, the city of Anchor, which I talked about in Khmer Empire, Gujarat, which was in North India, Delhi, which was actually a city also, Kashgar, which is in Central Asia, Samarkand, also in Central Asia, Baghdad, Constantinople, Timbuktu, which was in Mali, West Africa, Venice, Italy was one because it's on the Mediterranean. So that's going to be a trading site. Cordoba, Spain, because it's on the uh, it's on the southern edge and it's along the Mediterranean and the right near the Atlantic Ocean. And London, London being an island nation, they're going to have to be a little bit more uh, open to trade so that they can uh, expand a little bit better. OK. Uh, talk about some of the trade routes you're going to need to know for the test from unit one and, and unit number two. Uh, the first trade route is the Trans-Saharan trade route. Uh, this is the uh, one that goes across the Sahara in Africa. We learned about this as being the gold salt trade. Some other items that were traded here, ivory, and then also human lives, slaves. Um, they used caravans, and usually they used camel to transport goods across, across the Trans-Saharan trade route. A second major one is of course the Silk Roads. Um, the Silk Roads in China and through the Middle East, those are basically going to be uh, examples of what you're gonna wanna know uh, as luxury goods. You know, luxury goods, porcelain, silk, Persian and Indian textile, basically Persian rugs. If you've ever heard of those, they're like these really large rugs made in the area of Persia. Um, so those are some of the things you're gonna wanna know that were transported along the Silk Roads. So the Silk Roads, once again, 
Uh, let me show you. The Silk Road would be kind of like, all right, from China running through India and then getting yourself all the way to the Middle East. So along this path here and then even over here to the north also. You got a lot of different routes that the Silk Road take, but generally in this area and this region here. The Trans-Saharan is in this region here, right in this area here. Okay, that trade. And the last one is going to be Indian Ocean. And when you're talking about Indian Ocean trade, you're talking about right in here, all in this area here, Indian Ocean trade. Okay, so in the Indian Ocean trade, you're talking once again about luxury items, bulk goods like champa rice, slaves, humans, spices. Spices was a big one, right? We learned about in the late 1400s. That's where Europeans are really trying to get uh, some of their trade in. Um, stonework and horse. Horse is another one that should be on that list. Um, I don't know if it's right horse or horses. I'm not sure which one's right. I'm not sure. It's been a while since I had grammar class. Nonetheless, um, what they benefited from are the use of the Latin or triangular sail. We learned about that a little bit later. We said this is one of the big components of the caravel ship. Uh, but the triangular sail really allowed uh, you to sail against the wind. That's the idea of it. They had the compass. They had the astrolabe, which is a Muslim invention to uh, track the area or location of the stars so that you can then know your lines of latitude and longitude. There's a ship, a special ship called the Chinese junk ship. It's a very large ship. It's a cargo. It's like the world's first true cargo ship. What you're going to want to know about all of this, you're going to really want to know, okay, what are the innovations here of these trade routes and what are the goods that are traded? So I gave you some, some basic examples here. I think that should be enough uh, to get you going forward. Okay, a couple more slides and then we'll be done. Um, here is uh, just, a, just a little bit of Unit 2 breakdown. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit less about Unit 2 because it's getting closer and closer uh, to the modern time. So I think you should be uh, more well-versed on this. Um, basically, the spread of innovation and culture, um, the spread of Islam, and also Jewish communities along trade routes began to develop. Uh, Muslims are really focused on trade. And one of the big reasons why is, if you remember, Muhammad and his wife, were both caravan traders. That, that was their job. So they're like, oh, if it was good enough for Muhammad, we can also do that. Along with this is going to spread religion. And that's another example of cultural diffusion. I told you that cultural diffusion was just such a big component of all of this. Jewish merchants set up communities along trade routes throughout many regions as well. Languages were spreading during this time period. For example, Swahili, which I talked about earlier, was a mix of African Bantu and also Arabic. It's a blended language. Arabic numerals uh, form the basis for our modern numbers. They came originally from India. And uh, numbers like 1, 2, and 3 replaced the old school Roman numerals, which kind of made it hard to do addition with Roman numerals, right? Uh, so the Arabic numerals um, originally coming from India are what kind of take over. Uh, woodblock printing from China eventually led to the printing press process, which was developed by Gutenberg in 1453. Um, so just, just outside of this scope there, um, in, in 1450. Okay, finally, some other basic ideologies here, some things that we want to remember. Champa rice, obviously we learned about that. Bananas, they came from Southeast Asia and then eventually they get into Africa and the East Coast. From the Americas, you've got the corn, maize, and you've got potatoes. Tea and sugar coming from, from Asia and then of course being spread into the New World eventually. Gunpowder coming from the song, paper, compass, printing. This is why, I mean, the song are really influential here. Europeans, like I said, were lagging very far behind Asia in many categories until Christopher Columbus. I mean, once the Americas are explored, that blows it uh, to another level. I mean, once you get silver and gold and potatoes and tomatoes and maize coming in from the Americas, now the Europeans are able to compete with the Asian base. Once again, Song, Abbasid, the Americas, Mali, Swahili Coast. If you study anything, study those. Um, culture spreading, migratory paths, nomadic groups that were still around like the Mongols, cultural diffusion. These are some of the big picture things that I think you guys would, would really benefit from studying. Okay, that's my talk today on unit one and number two. We're almost at 40 minutes. Um, I'm gonna come back here to the, uh, to the